Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And uh, all, all women here and also the two men here accompanying us, my, com my comrades, uh, Carlos and Stuardo. We are now starting with our hearing number nine of the period of sessions number 187 of the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, which has a very important and uh, significant topic in our region. We have entitled it the differential impacts on the lives of women and family members of persons deprived of their liberty in our Americas. This hearing has been requested by the International Network of Women Next of Kin of Persons Deprived of the Liberty. The presence of all of you here today is the the reflection of the importance of this topic. My name is Esmeralda Rosemena de Troitinho, first vice president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I'm also con a rapporteur for the rights of children and adolescents and of the rights of indigenous peoples. Alongside me in this hearing, we have Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, Rapporteur for the Rights of Women, Commissioner Suardo Rallon, Rapporteur for Persons Deprived of the Liberty, and also country reporters of different countries where people deprived of their liberty have been very significant. Also, we have Commissioner Carlos Bernal, who is Rapporteur for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Also with me today, we have Executive Secretary Tania Renault. Thank you for being here with us. And Special Rapporteur Soledad Garcia Munoz. And of course, our technical staff, our technical team, who is always ready and available for doing this work, including our photographers and our uh, audiovisual team who are allowing the whole um, public to be following this hearing because the hearing is followed by many people uh, through online for this all these technical and technological uh, tools that allow us to communicate nowadays. So, as you all very well know, since this is a regional hearing, we have the participation of civil society organizations, which during the hearing will have 25 minutes then we will have 25 minutes for the commission and then we will grant you other minutes so that you can have some final comments all of us know the purpose of the of this hearing but I do want to make an emphasis on the situation of the differential impact on women who are deprived of their liberty, but also for the family members. And also how this is very closely related with the criminal policy of our countries and the conditions of detention in the prisons of our country have. So this is a reason why being able to listen from you is very important. I truly acknowledge your work, your commitment of being there in the field uh, where, where the commission, the Inter-American Commission needs to have that information uh, submitted in a more direct way. And, and that is thanks to the commitment of all of you. So without further ado, I will give the floor now to the civil society organizations 
and you can uh, uh, organize the order of uh, participation. Please, I request from you that you introduce yourselves for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Good morning. My name is Andrea Casamento. I am the president of the Civil Association of uh, Family Members of Detainees, ACIFAD, based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I thank the Honorable Commission for this space, and especially because what we usually hear from, of women family members is that they are not heard. So this is a first opportunity and having granted this hearing is truly very important for us. This is an opportunity to make visible the violations to which we are subjected, not only from the perspective of what happens in my country, but also from an intersectional point of view and understanding that the effects that prison produces in the lives of women who are family members in the Latin American and Caribbean region, along with the rest of the world, are experienced in a similar way, regardless of the country, the culture of the religion that they practice. This is a perspective that guided us to create this international network of family members. Because although today this hearing is, uh, Amer is at the level of the Americas, also a Catalan organization is part of our network. And I assure you that the violations faced by the relatives, the family members are just as serious as ours. Our network has been working nonstop in an articulated manner for two and a half years. Our network is composed of uh, organizations from the following countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Spain, El Salvador, Mexico, and Uruguay, which is a country that joined early this year and on behalf of the organizations uh, of the organization called Familias Presentes. The quantitative and qualitative data that we are going to put forward in this hearing uh, result from a regional study entitled The Impact of Prison on Women's Family Members and the Affectations to Their Human Rights, which was drafted in November 2022. This is the first and only study, regional study, on this topic. Also, the main contribution of our intervention is that it is based on our direct experience as family members. We are living firsthand what it means to have a family member deprived of their liberty. So in this projective terms, we estimate that for every person that is detained, there are five other people in their effective family environment who are suffering the effects of imprisonment. We understand that the number of people affected in the region is 3,304,563. Most of them are women, and of this total, at least 1,321,826 are children and adolescents whose uh, adult family member is deprived of their liberty. Family members are united by a common experience, the same path that we have traveled and the same desire to do something else. This is why it was necessary to join forces and to build information that would allow us to account for this reality. The situation that we are going to describe takes place in a context of serious setbacks in human rights in several countries of the region in the face of the of the multiplication of discourses against crime and citizens' insecurity. Punitivist orientations are today public government policies. The indiscriminate increase of arrests and the increase of prison population has direct consequences on our family environment. Also, we will mention 
a document entitled Principles and Good Practices on the Protection of the Rights of Women, Family Members of Persons Deprived of Their Liberty, which we call Bogota Principles. This document was drafted in October last year by all the organizations. We met in Colombia, Bogota, in the framework of the International Meeting of Rel Relatives of Persons Deprived of Their Liberty, and the document summarizes a series of recommendations and best practices that seek to protect the rights of family members of persons deprived of their liberty. This was drafted with the aim of serving as a basis, of, as a foundation for the adoption of international rules. Before my colleagues speak, I would like to read the petition that we would like the Commission to take into account for future actions. We request that the collective of women family members be considered as a group that is directly affected by incarceration, which is experiencing serious human rights violations throughout the region. We request the development of a work agenda with a gender perspective to prevent and to mitigate the human rights violations that we endure. This agenda should include the production of information from the Inter-American Commission, the preparation of a thematic report that includes documentation of cases and the promotion of public policies. In this regard, we also request that the member states of the OAS are required to produce information on the issue, to have working groups with the Inter-American Commission, to generate policies to alleviate the impact of prison on the lives of uh, women family members. We request that the Commission conduct in-local visits to our country so that they can learn firsthand about the violations to which we are subjected, and that during these thematic visits on prisons, this issue be considered. We request that the follow-up mechanism of the Convention of Belén do Pará addresses the situation of women, family members of persons deprived of their liberty, recognizing, acknowledging the particular conditions of vulnerability. We request a resolution recognizing the principles of Bogota as drafted. Thank you very much. I don't know who's next. Maybe our comrade from Ecuador is next. Yes, please go ahead. Ana Morales, you have the floor, but I think I think you're speaking, but we can't hear you. Good morning. Can you hear me now? It's okay. Great. My, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. On behalf of Ecuador, for listening. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ana Morales. I am the main spokesperson of the Committee of uh, Persons of uh, Family Members of Justice in Prison. I lost my son in September 28, 2021, who was killed in Ward 5 of the Literal Penitentiary Center, one of the bloodiest prison massacres that unfortunately have been happening in my country since 2018. Convención Americana de Derechos Humanos, Artículo 4 y 5, Derecho Section a la Vida. Section 4 and 5, Right to Life and Integrity, Personal Integrity, and to Vulnerations to the Rights and Health. Madam Ana Morales, we cannot hear you anymore. Your image is frozen. Can you please repeat the last sentence? Ana Morales speaking, can you hear me? Tanya Roman speaking, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Ana Morales speaking. Shall I start over? Okay, 
So I'd like to talk to you about the vulnerations of the American Convention of Human Rights, sections four and five, rights to integ personal integrity and right to life and vulnerations to the rights of health. Since 2018 up to 2022, the bodies of 591 persons deprived of liberty were re removed from the prisons of Ecuador and 65% were murdered in massacres. According to the records of the Permanent Committee of Human Rights sustained on formal information published by the press, the people, the bodies of other people were found uh, mostly due to hangings. In view of this tragedy, the families had no response whatsoever from the state ne uh, and even less from the Justice Department. So in, as a consequence, the family members have created an organization and we are part of this network of women family members of persons deprived of liberty. We have joined and expanded at a regional and international level and we are moved by this fight to guarantee rights and for these uh, events uh, that happen in my country so that they don't occur anymore. The state has no control over what happens within prisons, which are ruled by self-government rules. The state enabled organized crime organizations to have access to them and the families we are affected by this nevertheless there is no extortion that can guarantee the people of those pe persons that are deprived from liberty and there are people who have lost their loved ones the state have the obligation to guarantee the integrity of the person deprived of liberty and family members are victim of torture we the, the treat the way that the state treats us is a clear example of torture so as a community of family members we have requested the state throughout a protection action so that the state can recognize that the, it is responsible from this violation to human rights that have given place to the crisis of prisons and that have caused this hearing to happen. And they request a judge from here, from Ecuador, to listen to our fight for justice. Those family members who have received the news that uh, family member deprived of liberty is uh, has deceased has a lot of consequences and as a result of this pain many family, family members have insomnia depression and excessive anguish and even the death of those mothers in view of the shock of this news according to our study 82 percent of women indicated that their health state has uh, been deteriorated with the imprisonment of their family member. As to health, mental health, many declared to uh, to have a worsened their mental state, its health, and according to these um, declarations, none of them has received mental assistance and children and adolescents are the most impacted ones. The Inter-American Commission of Human Rights still has some measures pending presented in, 20, in 1992. And the community has received many petitions from organizations from Ecuador in view of these violations that occur in, in within the prisons. As of today, there has been no answer to this request. In parallel, there have been no progress in connection with the recommendations issued by the Inter-American Commissions of Human Rights in the reports of those persons deprived of liberty in 
Ecuador in 2022. Thank you very much. That is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Dear commissioners, thank you very much for this space. My name is Lucia Alvarado. I'm a representative of the Integral Assistance Center of Persons Deprived of Liberty in Mexico. In this case, I would like to talk to you about the economic impact and the consequences of having someone there is a deprived of liberty. This economic impact relies on women relative because it is in our roles that we visit our loved ones in prison. Our economic situation worsens because we have extraordinary costs in order to compensate for those uh, loved ones that are in prison. We provide care and that is hardly recognized as work. We showed in our study that in view of the incarceration of a family member, 90% had to take upon another job and 25% had to take another extra hours. In this study, it is evidence that the prisons in the region do not uh, comply with their obligations vis-a-vis -vis persons deprived of liberties. And we, in, in our visits, we have to provide basic Twenty-five percent had to provide uh, clothes and medications. This vulnerates an economic situation and impoverishes our families. We have to mention that several prisons within the region are far from our homes, and we have to make long journeys in order to visit our loved ones. According to our regional studies, fifty percent of family members take between two and three hours to arrived to a local prison and 20% takes more than six hours. In Mexico in 2021, 91% of family members lived in a different entity from the, pre, uh, the prison where their family member is. Some are more than 550 kilometers away. So for each visit, family members spend between 60 and $600. According to the survey carried out in Mexico, the women that visit prisons take product, basic products. 67% took uh, pri uh, private hygiene, 14% medicines, and 13% material for work. Just to provide some examples. In our region, the authorities act against our dignity because the, uh, these practices are carried out in, uh, against women and children and adolescents. In our prisons, there are scanners. Nevertheless, the authorities in prisons do searches that are intrusive and that violate our dignity. In the region, 85% of women surveyed mentioned that they were mistreated by the staff of the of the prison. These problems are issued are stated in the Bogota principles, mainly on principle three, principle six as well, and principle nine referring to the rights of children and adolescents. The minimum rights of protection recognize the effects that the penalties of persons the right of liberty have in their family members. That is why we request to this honorable commission to dictate a resolution in which they adopt the principles and good practices on the protection on family members, women family members of persons deprived of liberty as an instrument that provides for standards and duties of protections for the family members of persons deprived of liberty. Thank you very much. Good morning. 
Good morning. Thank you for this space and the participation. I am Wendy Morales. I'm the director of the association Azul Originario. I'm a survivor of a, the, an illegal detention at El Salvador and a defender of human rights. Since March 27, 2022, in this context, there is suspension of constitutional guarantees and rights for all the population, such as the right of defense and to respect the rights of persons deprived of liberty, freedom of movement, association, and the inviolability of communications in which the family members of persons deprived of liberties see themselves truly affected by the discrimination and criminalization that creates fear. The suspension of these basic rights, such as the right to have a lawyer, in view of a, 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 a detention by the police force and to be faced to a ju judge 72 hours after the capture and the lack of correspondence without the, the order of a judge is very, very serious and very complex for family members. And we had to survive to different situations such as difficulties in health, social, economic, and political difficulties. The actions of the state were justified by progress of um, justice, such as the reduction of homicides in the country. Even though it is true, in parallel, there is a reality that does not contemplate many violations that are not being approached in an integral manner. The current government has inaugurated a confinement centers, the code for terrorism, that it was presented as the greatest prison in the country. These facilities have doubled the incarceration facilities, capacities in the country, and they go over 60,000 people. This made El Salvador the highest country with the highest incarceration rate in the world. According to a study, the Salvador, as of March 2022, before the regime started, has 605 persons imprisoned, and now it has doubled. 2% of the population in Salvador is incarcerated. So the families are going through this incarceration of their loved ones in without any protection and without information of their situation and a lot total lack of communication, invulnerability of the right to uh, this bond between family members. Prior to the this regime, there were violations to the rights of the families, such as in the situation of urgency, that is a, an element that exists that in due of a state of emergency, there are some guarantees that can be suspended, such as communication and the visit of family members. And this was even worse with the pandemic. And nowadays, many people uh, are not aware of the state of health of their family members, or if even if they are alive. All communication and protect, protection of the family bond is suspended. I would like to mention that the women are responsible of doing all the necessary administrative steps before the authorities, and a 17% of women qualifies this uh, treatment against women as regular or bad. So many times the decision of the courts determine the fact of having access to a right or not. On many occasions, women are seen as suspects because of the fact of having a relative deprived of liberty. 75% has been has declared to have felt discriminated. In parallel, when they deny their rights, they foster the difference the in 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 the role of women and the we have to reflect on the effects of these practices that create um 
and subjectivity, subjectivity on women family members, and we have to reflect on the damages this may cause. Thank you very much. Is it is it done? We are just on time. Is that so? Very well. Thank you very much for all this information. This is a situation that the Commission has, to which the Commission has a strong uh, commitment and a close monitoring mechanism to address this in a comprehensive way. way. Now I will give the floor first to Commissioner Julissa Mantilla in her capacity as Rapporteur for the Rights of Women. And I will give the floor first to her precisely for the the approach that has given by has been given by the civil society organizations while they uh, focus on the significance of the women family members of persons deprived of their liberty and, and women who are deprived of their liberty as well. Thank you very much, Madam Chair of this uh, hearing. Uh, greetings to my colleagues and a very, very cordial and very respectful greetings to each of the women who are at this hearing. Not only today, and not only for what you did today, but for your daily work, you represent many women. And we have had many previous meetings uh, before this. So I congratulate you. See, if anyone who is watching this and is, has any doubts of the importance of the gender approach, I think this hearing has shown why it is so important to have this differentiated perspective of the gender roles. Many times they speak of uh, gender ideology, please. This are the roles that you are taking, which are the classic care roles, women who go there as wives, as daughters, while women who are deprived of the liberty do not receive necessarily the same assistance by their husbands as you are. You have submitted so much information that we will take into account. I would like you to submit further information if you have it on some particular situations because you, on top of being women who are family members of people who are deprived of liberty, they also suffer, you also suffer human by human rights violations in your role. So I would like to know more about the topic of sexual violence, not only rapes, but also sexual um, threats that you can be subjected to when you go to assist your uh, family members. These threats by authorities, by officials, so that you can visit your relatives. And also the situation of many women deprived of their liberty who are live in a prison with their children. We have just been in Honduras. Some uh, women have two, have children uh, up to four years old and then the grandmothers take the care of those children. So I would like to make visible the situation in further detail. And finally, I heard all of you, but I also, I'm also a country reporter for El Salvador. So there is a very concerning situation there. And I would like to suggest we have here the executive secretary, the possibility of our next press release on the situation of Salvador, uh, underscoring this, not only people who are deprived of the liberty in a regime that has decided to uh, to combat criminality through imprisonment, uh, I would like to highlight that the, this is not only women uh, this is not only persons who are in prison, but actually the women relatives are suffering with this irrational measure. So all the information that you can provide on this topic will be fundamental. And especially, as I said, the proposals that you have brought to this hearing are important to, to request from the states to, to incorporate the voices of women family members in their policies. Let me conclude by truly thanking, deeply thanking you. Next week we'll be in Washington and we'll be presenting this report on women deprived of the liberty. This is a report, as you have said at the beginning, in which we also have to highlight family members and what it means in terms of sexual and reproductive health for those 
girls, for those mothers and for those grandmothers. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. I give the floor to Commissioner Suardo Rallon, Rapporteur for People Deprived of the Liberty. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I would like to start by first acknowledging, of course, the enormous work conducting, conducted and do, that you have been conducting in such an adverse over a, a landscape, sorry, uh, for, for people deprived of their liberty. I have had to visit during crisis moments many of the most complex prisons in history. We saw a, a very harsh testimony of a person who lost his uh, her child in such a bloody prison massacre. So on top of acknowledging this, I would like to point out that the work that you do makes visible uh, vulnerabilities and a differential uh, impact by prison management models that have failed in the region and that are creating vulnerability vulnerations of different magnitudes for example these are some uh, issues that are shared by many countries for example the abuse of preventive imprisonment normally this is the rule and it calls it call it causes overcrowding and the abuse of this measure is an obstacle for the state to manage this with a human rights approach the, the, the protection of the lives and integrity of the detainees because the management model uh, becomes hurdle. But then when there is an abuse of this preventive prison, a family is uh, fragmented. And these things that you have mentioned start to happen. Possibly the situation could have been avoided if this has had not been applied as an anticipated sentence, but only in extraordinary circumstances. So this phenomenon that it continues to be an enormous challenge and one of the main problems of the prison systems entails a series of differential affectations, external affectations that are part of the impact that, what, that you describe. On the other hand, when there is a penitentiary survey carried out, we have the information of who are the people who were imprisoned. So the analysis of this information must be uh, used to create prevention public policies. So due diligence in doing so can also prevent these differential impacts from happening because if this were to exist the this could avoid having people uh infringe in the law because there are diverse opportunities available for them so that would prevent this differential affections and also the rehabilitation or reincorporation into society because when there is no such an approach, the problem or the differential impact uh, that is affecting women family members, I mean, you gave this point of data for each detainee, at least there are five other people who are uh, being affected. This uh, affects speak of the fact that people cannot be reincorporated, they cannot find the job once again. And that creates over time, over the whole detention time and, and afterwards this affectation. So I think it's very important to have your views here because you point to different differential effects and different impacts. And that helps us to analyze each case in further detail. Also, I request from you, as we do not have enough time in these sort of hearings, if you could submit 
via writing the information that you have at hand, the statistics would be very useful. With re regards to the document of principles of good practices, the Bogota principles, it would be very useful to have it and to be able to analyze that document. The rapporteurship of people deprived of the liberty is one of the rapporteurships that given the magnitude of the problem and the short um, resources that we have, what we can do is make visible and try to articulate through technical assistance, any uh, activity with the state. So the the input that you bring here with the data, with experiences and testimonies help us to, to conduct our work better. So big congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carlos Bernal, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for allowing me to intervene. I would also like to thank the people who have participated in this hearing for their courageous work and for making visible this problem. I think this is one of the human rights violations, structural human rights violations that are the most among the most serious in the continent. It is the only one that is not discriminated per country, right? As someone said at the beginning, when they referred to Catalonia, this is something that happens throughout the continent uh, from the north of Canada uh, to the south of Argentina and also in the Caribbean. So I'd like to, to pose two specific questions as to not repeat some of the things that my colleagues have already said. First, I would like to know about the consultation process that led to these Bogota principles, whether you can share further details of these principles. I think that these principles are very are, are nice because these are so, sorts of standards, but they were the result of a consensus of civil society. Secondly, as in my capacity as rapporteur for people with disabilities, I would like to know if you have any information as regards people with disabilities that is disproportionate or special violations suffered by women who have disabilities or family members who have disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Now I ask the special rapporteur for economic, social, cultural, environmental rights, if she has any comments to make. Thank you, um, Madam Vice President and Chair of this hearing. Greetings to the Commission and all the colleagues in civil society organizations. Just a brief reflection. This hearing uh, has to result in us thinking who are mostly in centers of deprivation of liberty and who are the people caring for them. We have to reflect upon the feminization of care and how those care tasks also have an economic impact, economic impact for family economies, families that already have short uh, resources. So I have two questions. On the one hand, what could be the recommendations made by the commission in that sense, in terms of economic impact in the crisis of care within prison systems and the overburden of women, and also in terms of mental health that you brought to this table? And on the other hand, I would like to ask how the Commission could work towards making visible the situation. Of course, the rapporteurship is available with Commissioner Estuardo and the rapporteurship on prison on people deprived of their liberty and the Commissioner Julissa Mantilla. We are available for that. Thank you, uh, Executive Secretariat. Thank you very much, Madam President, and thank you to the Inter-American Commission and to the women that are here with us today, that the circumstances of their lives made them real defenders of human rights. 
we have to go to Guaya Santa Marta Baticla, to Mariona on a visit day, just to see that the lines of those who are visiting their family members are women that have bags of food, medicines, drinkable water, because they provide this care that should be the responsibility of the state to provide the basic elements that should be the responsibility of the state. So we are not only talking about an affectionate care, a close care, but also those responsibilities that you assume and that obviously have an impact on the economies of those families and the care of the children on the care of grandchildren and other relatives. So thank you for the prior conversations we've had and for the preparation for this audience be hearing because you are making visible a job that for different reasons is a job that is absolutely invisible for those who have, of us who know where we're talking about. And this is related to the impact of the criminal policies and how it affects families. So that impact that is related to the populist punitivism and how it affects women, men, children, older people that should have this care. So I know that you are going through these reflection processes as family members and in this dialogue that we're having today based on your experiences, I always think about Santa Marta, Graticla for men, Mariona for men, Guaya, men section, but also we should think about those women that are deprived of liberty and that do not have these strong bonds with the exterior world. So I'd like to know what you think about this regarding this real abandonment of gender that women deprived of liberty have usually have and how do you work on this reflecting on this based on your experience regarding criminal policies so i'd like to thank you once again very much for the preparation for being here today to discuss this on this forum that is broadcasted to the whole region and that thank you to go on fighting on this so that we can include this when we discuss these criminal policies. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you. In order to conclude the intervention of the commission, I echo the declaration of my colleagues because these are basics for the management within the commission of this problem, the handling of this problem that, as you said, in, a, in an extraordinary manner, have an impact as well on this cross-cutting aspect. So a question, that I have for you as a rapporteur, you have a data that I would like to have in a more specific manner as to this figure that is over 1 million children and adolescents that have a reference, a private reference of someone deprived of liberty. And what does it mean? in the life of these children and adolescents, and even for those who are with their mothers up to two to three years old, and the consequences after they go out. So I would like to have some data on this. And to do this together with the request made by our colleagues to have all this information that is very rich, very vast, with that covers a lot of topics that you have recorded and that you have classified in this study. 
also regarding the principles. I would like to know them in more detail. I think that there is an engagement that as a rapporteur for children and also as a member of the board of directors, I have this need to evaluate and to assess a document as the one you have mentioned and that Commissioner Bernard has highlighted to know how this came about because it is an experience that is very interesting that we also need to have and to have this information as to its origin and the result it has today for the analysis and the assessment of this topic that implies a very solid view, as the Commission Matias said, no one can have a doubt today as what this situation of detainees, everything that is related to prisons and all the criminal policy in our countries and the impact that this may have and has as well uh, in family, women family members as those who are deprived of liberties, liberty and as you said, how this can affect them in their personal lives as family members of those persons deprived of liberties. And this affects exponen exponentially and in a negative and disproportionate manner the lives of women family members. I also think that it's very important this a petition that is made as the issuing of a decision. I think this is something that we should work in the assembly with all the information that you have submitted today. And I know that you have discussed this in prior meetings and I know that we can have a position in order to answer these requests and to assess this request that you have submitted. When we identified, as a colleague said, this action against dignity and there is an identification as to the approach and to the view of the victims themselves, this is an orientation and the principles to mention an example. So this is the responsibility that we have as a commission, as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and our commitment to accompany the victims and the different rapporteur offices where this situation occurs. Soledad, I see that your hand is raised. I don't know if you had a comment. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I know that we have some minutes left and I wanted to mention uh, if we could gather information, the commission in 1996 had a case related to the vaginal inspections of women and girls. And in at that time in Argentina, it was closed amicably. But uh, you mentioned that there are some places in which these inspections are carried out in a cruel manner, in human manner. And I'd like to know if these practices still occur. I think this is important uh, for the commission as well to know if this is the case. Very well. So in this manner, we conclude the intervention of the commission. And as stated in the distribution of time, we will give 22 minutes for final comments by our colleagues. 
that are here with us today, contributing with such valuable information. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Claudia Cardona. I belong to the Mujeres Libres in Colombia. To answer the question of uh, the com uh, commissioner, I will mention that the visit is a very important event to keep the bond with the detainee and the family members. But this event implies some controls and searches that expose women to sexual violence and other types of violence. But in most cases, the entering of prisons depends on the mood and the will of the staff and to deliver something in exchange, money or any other element they require in exchange. Women have to support, have to listen to comments uh, regarding their clothing, for instance, so we don't know how to behave. And in some cases, women have been forced to remove their shoes, for instance, to enter bare feet or to remove some clothing or so since this is not uh, included in the rules of prisons today it can be decided that with some clothing it is possible to enter the prison and the next day it is no longer valuable so women have the right to visit their family members deprived of liberty, respecting their dignity, because these are violences ex executed by public officers. The touching uh, uh, in the searches when visiting family members, not only for women, but also this is carried out on their children. They suffer violences. They make them remove their clothing women that have to uh, show that they are under their period and that they're not entering with anything illegal. Children are taught that no stranger should touch them. And when they go to visit a family member in prison, they're touched as if it was the most common practice in order to visit their mothers or fathers. So we would like to highlight that children and adolescents, children of women deprived of liberty, are not only the ones that encounter them in prison, but they're also outside the facilities. And many of them, even though they are with some family members as grandmothers or aunts or other family members, there are others that are under the care of other people and they have suffered violences, mental and sexual violences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for showing interest in this topic. This was a great idea, the creation of these standards that we mentioned. The principles of women deprived of liberty, or rather family members of persons deprived of liberty, was carried out in the national meeting, international meeting of family members of persons deprived of liberty, where we agreed the minimum standards. And this was a result of months of work. And all the members of this uh, civil associ society association, we share these uh, principles and we found common problems. We don't have to live in different countries. The situation in the and in a criminal system shows the same results. We found many similarities. Some are obvious in the document. And based on this, we planned the way in which we 
could include them in the report. And as I said, this was the result of months of work on four different topic, topics, the vulnerability to human life, the violations of the access to justice and to the judicial guarantees, violations to dignities and violations of gender and family members. And the fourth one was the treatment related to the social condition and economical condition of family members. I think there was a question of the disproportionate impact that family members suffer. And this is the case because as you mentioned, I believe that the state is given to the fact that this um, impact on economy is due to the fact that the state is not present. We have to uh, provide for all the elements required by someone who is imprisoned and who needs to live uh, with dignity. So, once again, thank you very much for your interest in the document we have drafted. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Andrea? Good morning. I'm Raila from Sao Paulo, Brazil. We are the third population to be in mass incarcerated, both men and women. And I would like to say to this commission very respectfully that we have suffered so many violations in these prisons. And how can we have mental health to face this? Because we are poor black women from the periphery, and we are here asking, begging for our care, to take care of our families that are incarcerated and for people and these mothers that are incarcerated within this perverse system that just incarcerates, tortures people. And we need to have a social follow-up with families, uh, children. We, we need to work with the justice system. And we all have a story and we need to have a different view because the criminal system is asking for help to families and to people that are uh, imprisoned, not only in Brazil, but also in the whole continent. These people have been suffering several violations because they don't have accessibility to other uh, possibilities. Imprisoned people help others, uh, prisoners. And we are asking for help for our prisoners because the state does not warranty this. In Sao Paulo, we understand that if we have a series of questions and answers in order to imprison people every 18 hours. So the system is asking for help and families are also asking for help because the violence that we experience is terrible, it's constant. When a woman comes here or a woman goes to a hospital, she stays in, for example, if she's uh, about to deliver her uh, baby, she's there. And then the doctor says, okay, you can go away without having a bath. That's violence. Uh, machism in prisons is everywhere. Women have visit days because they have their menstruation and we have the menstrual violation so that uh, we need to receive the absorbent pad. So we need to have an urgent view in the penitentiary system in Brazil, in Colombia, in the region. 
Thank you for your attention. I think we are done, right? Yes, I don't know if we have any more time, but I wanted to truly thank you for this meeting and for this possibility. We take note of all the questions that you have posed and we will continue with this exchange and we will send you all the information that you requested. I only want to add one final thing. The impact does not end when the person deprived of their liberty comes back home, because since there are no inclusion policies available, we are the ones who are in charge of accompanying the whole process. So there are no programs in any of the countries of the region to this. Uh, aim as we have had to learn how to uh, live with the person for 10 years and we have had to learn to live with that person when he or she comes back after those 10 years so we are completely alone in these terms in the criminal reports we are the ones who are assessed we do not have anything to do with this and we are demanded to, to, we, we are requested to feed them, to provide them with a home, to provide them with contention. And even though, even so, if we, even if we should, uh, we can uh, provide them with a job when actually it is the state that should be in charge of all of this. So I think we don't have any more time, but we all took a note of this. We will send all of these details to you and truly we are very thankful for the questions and for the time that you have invested in us and for the, your commitment we will be here for you as well thank you very much andrea thank you all of you truly um, when you hear these uh testimonies, these experiences, I think some of you have already said that you became human rights defenders. So these reports are very important. It's very important for us to always take them into account because this issue of institutional violence is an issue that we have to truly underscore as a, an important responsibility on the part of the states. Commissioner Rallone, pointed to this necessity of having plans for reinsertion into society for these people. This is also a demand for the states because the states have to have this as a part of their criminal programs so that people can go back to their lives once they are released. The stories that you have shared with us, but, but not, this, not the stories, but, but your experiences, your testimonies um, that point to such a serious situation that families are living that is family members as people who are responsible for care and, and, and also the situation that persons of deprived of the liberty are going through themselves. So our commitment as international uh, the, as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for this, for addressing this uh, topic that truly requires an intersectional, a comprehensive approach to arrive at a comprehensive response. Thank you very much for your commitment, your work, your support, and for having taken on this commitment with the aim of achieving the dignity of all persons, because what has to unite us as human rights defenders is that recognition of the dignity of all human beings, regardless of their, con of their condition. The important thing is the dignity of human beings. So thank you very much and have a great afternoon and we will remain in contact and we will remain in touch. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can, I'm we, sorry. can we take a picture?
Yes, por favor. Por favor. Yes, yes, yes. Please stay for a moment for a picture. Un segundito. Look at the camera just for a second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tiago. Goodbye. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.